environmental hygiene with a proposal in 2016. Mr. Thank you. 而提出的免遣犯申請下稱免遣犯申請數目大幅增加唯有印度籍職業介紹所串同本港的律師行招攬印度籍人士來香港提出申請藉以留港非法工作此外入境事務處官員近日也表示相信有人教唆申請人濫
That said, if a non-reforming claim is substantiated on grounds of persecution, the claimant will be referred to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees for consideration of arrangement of resettlement in a third country. My reply to the various parts of Honorable Chair's question is as follows. For parts 1 and 3, most of the 10,450 pending claimants originate from South or Southeast Asian countries, with Indians accounting for the most, 20%, followed by Vietnamese, about 20%, Pakistanis, 18%, Bangladeshis, 12%, Indonesians, 10%. That is, 80% of all claimants came from one of these five countries. According to immigration records, 46% of the claimants smuggled into Hong Kong. 47 entered as visitors, but did not leave Hong Kong before the limit of stay expired. That is, overstaying. The remaining 7% are mostly persons who lodged a non refarming claim on the spot after being refused permission to land upon arrival. Our figures indicate that 74% of claimants are male, 76% are between 18 and 40 years old, and 94% came to Hong Kong alone without their family. Most claimants, around 70%, lodged a claim only after having been intercepted or arrested by the immigration department or the police. Claimants who overstayed have hidden in Hong Kong for an average of 19 months before lodging a claim. The government is very concerned with recent reports that some agencies in India are suspected to be arranging Indian nationals to come to Hong Kong under a fictitious asylum visa, providing a range of services including transporting them from India to Hong Kong, providing legal service to ensure that they enter successfully and lodge a non refoundment claim for them afterwards, and while they are pending screening, arranging unlawful employment for them. Apart from serious abuses to our non refoundment screening mechanism, such services exposed in the reports may also involve a number of serious criminal offences amounting to human trafficking. Our law enforcement agencies, including the Immigration Department and the police, are conducting in-depth investigations through different channels. The LEAs will not acquiesce to any criminal activities. Stringent enforcement action will be taken against them. In recent months, the government has had multiple meetings with the Consul General CG of India in Hong Kong to express a profound concern against Indian agencies allegedly arranging Indian nationals to enter Hong Kong for unlawful employment. We pointed out to the CG that such activities may involve a number of serious criminal offences and requested the Indian government to render all possible assistance in combating such crimes. The government also proposed visits to India by LEAs to follow up with local enforcement agencies over there. However, we may not divulge further details at this stage, lest the relevant work would be undermined. Other than India, we will soon be in contact with the local consulates of such countries as Vietnam and Pakistan to discuss how to combat their national smuggling into or staying in Hong Kong as well as those syndicates which arrange such smuggling activities. At the same time, we will seek to promulgate and clarify our immigration policy through different channels to the people in relevant countries. All our efforts above are fully supported by the Office of the Commissioner of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Hong Kong. In fact, other than investigation and publicity work, we'll also conduct a holistic research on different measures to address and tackle our present problem, including intercepting illegal immigrants at the source, improving the screening procedures for non refoundment claims, expediting the screening process to minimize abuses and reducing incentive for foreigners to take up unemployment, unlawful employment in Hong Kong. We also consider whether the relevant legislation need to be amended to block various loopholes. 
Part 2. As regards expenditure, in the current financial year, the estimated expenditure arising from the screen of claims amounts to $644 million, an increase of 21% from last year. This includes $207 million for manpower expenditure under the Immigration Department, the Torture Claims Appeal Board, the Department of Justice to screen non refarming claims, $108 million for the provision of publicly funded legal assistance for claimants through the duty lawyer scheme, the uh, duty lawyer service DLS as required by law and three hundred and twenty nine million dollars to provide humanitarian assistance to claimants whilst they are stranded in Hong Kong to prevent them from falling destitute. As for the legal cost per claim processed under the publicly funded legal assistance scheme has in continued to rise, the government has requested DLS to strengthen its financial management to ensure the proper use of public funds. At the same time, given the surge in the number of non refarming claims, I've requested the Director of Immigration to explore all possible ways within the existing legal framework to expedite the screening of claims by more efficient use of available resources. In July 2015, the government briefed the panel on Security of its Council and a number of administrative measures which can be promulgated without amending the present legislation including advancing scheduling of screening interviews, providing screening bundle to claimants to save them from having to lodge a data uh, access uh, re request. We sought an early implementation of such measures to expedite the screening of claims. It is estimated the time required can be reduced from 25 weeks to 15 weeks. Although some stakeholders are still maintain a different view, we will continue to liaise with them and explain the importance of commencing the measures to expedite screening with view to securing cooperation of relevant stakeholders commencing these measures to expedite screening as soon as possible. The above notwithstanding, we predict that expenditure arising from screening of claims may continue to rise. We'll reveal, we are revealing whether our system resources are adequate and will seek additional resources on the prevailing mechanism if necessary. Thank you, President. Mr. Paul Chen. Uh, recently on the television screen we have seen the refugees. They are known they are not voluntary and they are homeless. But then for others who are overstaying and stopped at the airport, they aren't refugees at all. Now for our own citizens, whenever we need to apply for welfare benefits, we have to uh, make a statutory declaration, you will send you to jail if you make a mistake, and then you need to receive regular training. All such uh, we, uh, means that we try to uh, curb the public expenditure. But in this case, how can we be convinced that public funds are spent properly? So, Secretary, if the administrative measures are not effective, please tell us what legislation would be required to prevent Hong Kong being bullied by the suckers. Mr. Chair, for the economic support given by the torture claimants, we've been doing so in accordance with the court rulings uh, on a monthly basis. We provide rental allowance uh, amounting to $1,500, and then we have been giving out uh, $1,200 worth of food uh, coupons, and then uh, some uh, subsistence, uh, some allowance for utilities and a transportation allowance. Um, what we want to do is that while they are waiting for the screening, they would not become uh, destitute. That's the most basic. Uh, requirement. This is also a requirement in law. So according to our existing um, legal uh, framework, we must provide this kind of assistance to them. Of course, on the other hand, we don't allow them to work. It was started in 2009. We amended the immigration ordinance. Since year 2009, we have already prosecuted over a thousand people, and the court has already sentenced uh, the def offenders so as to achieve a deterrent effect. I believe that at different levels, we'll try to process the cases in accordance with the law. In our main reply, I have already told you about the nature of the problem, and we're going to have a comprehensive approach. We're going to re-examine the issue. I hope all the stakeholders can understand why we have to do this, and I call for their cooperation. What is the approach and what is the direction of the legislative amendments that you are thinking of? Yes, if I may talk about the broad approach. First of all, uh, almost 50% of the claimants are smugglers. Um, 
they have smuggled into Hong Kong. So in relation to um, smuggling arrangements, we try to see how we can um, aggravate uh, the penalties so that we can combat the problem at source. Secondly, for the assessment or the screening mechanism, if our proposed administrative measures require a legislative backup so as to enhance the effectiveness, then we have to do so. We are looking at the final details. We also plan to do the following, that is, after we have reached a certain degree of understanding with the stakeholders, uh, we are going to report to the panel on security of this council and listen to the views of members. Mr. Yip Kwok Kim, from the secretary's reply, I am glad to see that the government is very concerned about the allegation that an intermediary has claimed that um, it can make arrangements for us fictitious asylum visas for people to come to Hong Kong. Um, well, in fact, um, I also asked the CE during the question um, time concerning this matter. Now that lawyers have said that they can make arrangements, it is alleged that lawyers can uh, make the claims on behalf of such claimants before they alight from the plane. So if you say that there isn't collusion, I doubt very much. Is it a matter of breaching the law? I don't think so. Probably the lawyers are very familiar with the procedures and the loopholes. Please ask a question. Secretary, would you consider the following? That is, are you going to do some administrative work so as to stop this? Say, for example, are you going to make an announcement about the number of law firms and which law firms and the number of claims that have been lodged through them so as to enhance the transparency so that uh, under public monitoring and media monitoring, such law firms will be put off? Secretary, as to the measures proposed by Mr. Yip as well as others likely to be proposed by other members in a moment, we'll certainly study them. Whatever we are going to do has to be done in accordance with the law. And other than publishing the information, I think we also need a series of other measures so as to combat such syndicate-like um, work. That is, they solicit foreigners to come into Hong Kong unlawfully. That's why in my main reply, I've emphasized that the police and the immigration department have cooperated uh, and they have joined hands and they're carrying out a thorough investigation. We've also talked to the Consul General of India. We've also asked for um, the arrangement to send our LEAs to go to India. We have also secured the support of the Office of the Commissioner of the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Hong Kong. We believe that it would be more effective and quicker to tackle the problem at source. We hope that by enlisting their help through a number of uh, measures, we can start this work ASAP. Dr. Elizabeth Quart. Thank you, Mr. President. Less than 1% of the claims lodged over the years has been substantiated. The facts are clear. The majority of them are fake uh, refugees. They come to Hong Kong to be unlawfully employed, to engage in criminal activities, to make money, and they want to get welfare benefits. They abuse the system. They drag the procedures, creating a heavy burden on us. Mr. President, we have a backlog of over 10,000 cases, uh, a monthly increase of three to 400 cases, and we have to spend $600 million a year. The Secretary has said that the uh, bill is expected to rise. How can we bear such a heavy burden? Please ask a question. Um, citizens would like to ask this question. 
I would like to ask this question as well. In the past, we used to have the boat people camps. Why can't we do the same? Then we can remove the incentive to come because they cannot、uh, get employed illegally. Secretary, I would like to thank the member for showing her concern. It isn't just our concern on the part of the government. Even the courts have also、um, shared. Uh, some observations with us concerning such a trend.、Um, in fact, in a case,、um, we have been told that、um, the number of claims is going up, and it is、uh, affecting、um, our mechanism. The、uh, Unreasonable claims should be screened out、uh, ASAP so as to prevent、um, malicious、uh, claims being、uh, lodged. That's、uh, found in this、um, court case、um, against Tarotus.、Um, so I have、uh, talked about、um, the approach, the direction. Now, you,、uh, the honourable member, talked about the、uh, closed camps. Or the detention centers for the Vietnamese refugees,、uh, that can be considered as a direction of our future work. It can be studied.、Um, Mr. James Tin, my question is similar to that asked by Elizabeth Court or members of the DAB. If we can set up a、uh, closed camp、uh, like the one for the Vietnamese boat people. It will be very effective as soon as we make an announcement of the establishment of such a detention camp.、Um, well, in fact,、um, for the countries involved, none of them are politically unstable. They come here mainly to make money. So, if we make an announcement telling them that they will be barred from going out to work before they are screened. Uh, they will not come because currently they are getting jobs. So, are you going to study the idea ASAP? We need to spend money, six hundred million dollars a year. And、uh, why don't you spend the six hundred million dollars on the establishment of a closed、uh, detention center, secretary? Well.、Um, For people who come into Hong Kong illegally, like、uh, they smuggle into Hong Kong or they overstay, well, the immigration department may detain them before they are removed. And in fact,、um, recently we have got、uh, judicial reviews and also um, the um, Hibakopus Hiba、uh, applications.、Um, I understand that we cannot make it unreasonable or unduly long.、Uh, for the idea of a closed detention centre, what we have to do is to pass a piece of legislation. But at the same time, we have to consider whether the legislation to be enacted will be in line with the requirements of the basic law. If we don't do it properly. Then it will only attract even more lawsuits. Therefore, we have to be、um, cautious here. You do need to introduce a piece of legislation. We used to have the camps for the boat people. We didn't have a piece of legislation. Why can't we do the same here? No need for piece of law. Well, in fact,、uh, there was legislative、uh, backup for the case of the boat people. So on this occasion, legislative approach is necessary. As I have said, if an immigrant, if the immigration department would like to. Um, detain a person administratively.、Uh, we can only do so for a reasonable period of time. We spent over 23 minutes. Many members would like to ask questions. Please do so on other occasions. Question two, Mr. Michael Tian. Mr. President, a lot of citizens have relayed to me that dripping air conditioners have caused them grave nuisance, including making noises and. Soiling clothes. The problem is very common across the territory. You see, this、uh, picture I have in my hand.、Uh, well, one third of the area of、um, this bus stop 
is avoided by a lot of people. Well, it has been reported that in the years 2004 to 2014, the authorities received over 1,700,000 complaints in total, but issued only 5,256 warning letters and instituted 12 prosecutions only, with the prosecution rate standing at a mere 0.007%. In the first half of this year alone, the authorities received 8,900. 8,900 complaints and no prosecution has been instituted. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, given that while the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department, FEHD, made under the Public Health and Municipal Services Ordinance, take enforcement actions including issuing nuisance notices and nuisance orders to the persons causing the nuisance or the occupiers or the owners of the relevant premises to require the persons concerned to abate the nuisance within the specified period. The maximum penalties for failure to comply are merely a fine of ten thousand and twenty five thousand dollars respectively plus a daily fine. Whether the government has reviewed if such penalties are effective in pressing the persons concerned to expeditiously resolve the problem of drifting air, air conditioners, if it has, and the outcome is in the negative, whether the government will increase the penalties to enhance the deterrent effect. And two, given that while authorities indicated in their reply to a question raised by a member of this council in 2013 that in order to raise public awareness, FEHD disseminates messages in summer through releasing APIs on television and radio and distributing posters and leaflets to owners' corporations, mutual aid committees, property management companies and members of the public. Some citizens have pointed that such publicity efforts have little impact. And the FHD frontline staff are under considerable pressure whether the government will set up a dedicated team to handle the problem of dripping air conditioners and complaint cases in a more efficient manner and provide training courses to staff members on handling more difficult cases. Secretary for Food and Health. Mr. President, uh, the FEHD has all along been vigilant about nuisance caused by dripping air conditioners. Apart from handling complaints, the FEHD conducts special inspections at black spots of dripping air conditioners with heavy pedestrian flow, such as roadside bus stops, public light bus stands and pedestrian crossings during different hours of the day, including early morning and the evening. Upon receiving a complaint on dripping air conditioners or when such is spotted during routine inspections, the department will send a health inspector of the district to carry out investigation as soon as possible. In most cases, after receiving the rectification request, including verbal warning and advisory letter issued by the department's officers, the flat owners or occupants will take remedial action to obey the nuisance caused. If the verbal warning or advisory letter is unheeded, the Department will issue a nuisance notice under Section 127 of the, Municip of the Public Health and Municipal Services Ordinance, Cap 132. A, no a nuisance notice requires the relevant person to obey the nuisance within the specified period in the notice. Any person who fails to comply with the requirements stated in the notice will be prosecuted and is liable upon conviction to a maximum penalty of $10,000 and a daily fine of $200 should the, should the offence persist. Besides, if the person has been convicted of failing to comply with the nu nuisance notice, should the nuisance persist, the department will apply to the court for a nuisance order requiring the person concerned to comply with the requirement within a specified period. Failure to comply with the order may lead to prosecution. Upon conviction, the offender is liable to a maximum penalty of $25,000 and a daily fine of $450 should the offence persist. From 2004 to 2014, the department received on average about 15,000 complaints every year relating to dripping air conditioners. During the same period, the department has issued a total of 5,261 notices, nuisance notices. An X1 gives the number of complaints received and no nuisance notices issued in each year. Under the current legislation and system, if the dripping water is properly collected and drained away without causing any nuisance, then is considered abated. Generally speaking, dripping air conditioners is usually caused by minor problems such as poor or loose connection of drain hoses, 
blockage to drainage outlets or absence of water drip pans. The flat owners or occupants are, us are usually able to repair the air conditioners with dripping problem within a short time after receiving the request of ratification or nuisance notice from the department. Therefore, in a great majority of the cases, the department does not need to take further prosecution action. In the past 10 years, the department instituted prosecutions in 12 cases for non-compliance with the notice. Each summer, the department will re release APIs on media such as television and radio, pro produce posters and leaflets for distribution to owners, corporation, mutual aid committees and property management uh, agents, PMAs, for the purpose of reminding the public to conduct regular repair and maintenance in the interest of uh, preventing water dripping. The FHD launched in 2005 a pilot scheme entitled Participation by Property Management Agents in Tackling Dripping Air Conditioners. It extended the scheme to the entire territory in 2009. Under the scheme, PMAs of private housing estates are invited to assist in handling complaints about dripping air cons in their housing estates during the summer season. Currently, 33 PMAs covering 120 private housing estates in the territory have participated. In 2014, a total of 7,400 water dripping cases were handled by these PMAs. The FHD will continue to promote the scheme each summer. My reply to the various parts of the questions are as follows. 1. At present, the maximum penalty for failure to comply with the requirements of a nuisance notice or nuisance order is a fine of $10,000 and $25,000 respectively. As mentioned earlier, most of the owners or occupants will promptly rectify the problem after receiving warnings or the notices from the department officers to avoid prosecution or penalty. It is therefore evident that the existing penalty level carries reasonably strong deterrence. For the 12 prosecutions in the past, the fines imposed by the court ranged between $300 and $2,500. Since the penalties imposed are some distance away from the statutory maximum level, we have not given consideration to uh, increasing the penalty for the time being, but we will review it. Two, I hope uh, honourable members and the public will understand the difficulties in handling complaints about dripping air conditioners because, one, cases of nuisance caused by dripping air conditioners mostly occurred at night and or in the early morning. It's difficult for the officers to locate the source of nuisance in dim light. Two, most residential blocks are high-rise buildings with air conditioners installed vertically at the same location on each floor. This prolongs the investigation process as there may be multiple sources of dripping. 3. In the course of conducting inquiries, we may run into cases when the occupants or owners are not at home or not willing to cooperate. These add difficulties to our work. 4. There are also cases where the water dripping pro uh, problems occurring shortly after the aircons have been repaired. At present, about 290 health inspectors are deployed to the 19 district environmental hygiene officers across the territory to handle environmental hygiene issues in the district, including inspecting licensed food premises and non-food premises, for example, commercial bathhouses and cinemas, and dealing with the relevant licensing matters, prosecuting unlicensed food premises, processing license applications for operating temporary places of public entertainment, investigating food complaints and food poisoning cases, as well as complaints related to environmental hygiene problems. In 2014, they have to act on more than 49,000 complaints related to environmental hygiene nuisances, among which 19,000 cases involved dripping air cons. In cases of nuisance caused by dripping air conditioners tend to cluster in summer months, the workload of the district environmental hygiene offices may register a substantial increase within a short period of time in summer. To reduce the work pressure of frontline officers in handling such cases, the FHD has implemented a pilot scheme in the summer of 2014 and this year. Under the scheme, retired health inspectors are recruited on short-term on short-term contracts, such that the officers could make good use of their experience to help handling problems of dripping air conditioners. Besides, um, well, um, because we are, we know about the difficulties when handling uh, such cases. The department organizes experience sharing sessions and workshops on the handling skills for the for uh, our staff from time to time, including experience sharing on cases investigated by the Office of the Ombudsman, workshops, and courses on effective negotiation and influence and uh, skills. In particular, the FHD has been arranging half-day courses on handling complaints about nuisance caused by dripping air conditioners. Uh, to 
to enhance their efficiency in this respect. Where necessary, the FHD will invite officers from other departments. We'll review the current practice and uh, we will also have to uh, get support from the community as a whole with um, members of public each exercising self-discipline and play their role to keep their aircon in good repair. repair. This will bring social harmony and a good living environment. Mr. Tian, well, most of the um, owners, occupants in the concerned premises will take re remedial action. And he also said that uh, in general, within a very short time, um, these cases would have been tackled. So in the past 10 years, out of the 180,000 cases, 165,000 of them have been resolved after advice have been given. However, the secretary said, also said that uh, dripping air condition conditioners uh, are mostly problems in at night or in the early morning. So it's difficult for the officers to see. And, and at the same time, the occupants or the owners may not um, be cooperative. So what is he trying to say? Most of the cases have been resolved, or most of them have not been resolved. And in the past 10 years, out of the 165,000 so when a complaint has been received without issuing a warning letter, how many of them are cases when you can't identify the source or you can't gain entry in the premises and as a result have to leave the cases at that? Mr. Tian has pointed out uh, some um, scenarios to us, but in short, I don't have the data. That's my answer. If you don't have the data, then how can you say that these cases have been resolved? Can I assume that 165,000 cases have not been resolved? Because in your reply, you said that they have been resolved. Mr. Tian, your question has been answered. If you have new questions, you have to queue again. Mr. Christopher Chung. Thank you. Well, during... Um, Good days in summer, Wan Chai, Causeway Bay. I think you will have to bring a, an umbrella with you or um, wear a raincoat when you're waiting for the bus, otherwise you get wet. Dripping air conditioners cause, uh, causes a nuisance and it's uh, very annoying. However, the FEHD has not done anything effective to tackle the situation. I have a suggestion. Will the government look into it? Do you make use of the summary offences ordinance when they find dripping air conditioners issue fixed penalty tickets? It's just like uh, illegal parking. So that hopefully this will be a deterrent so that the occupants will rectify the situation as soon as possible. Thank you. Secretary. But to be honest, um, I have never considered Mr. Jung's proposal. On one hand, we'll keep an open mind, but I'd like to say that uh, this is not a, an easy approach. For issuance of um, fixed penalty tickets under the Summary Offences Ordinance are those um, that people are safe, for example, dealt with immediately on the spot, say uh, littering because you will be able to see the culprit. Uh, we are considering a, a new arrangement recently, say, for example, uh, for shops that have put their good start blocks um, public passageway, we deal with it in the same way. But when it comes to dealing with uh, dripping air conditioners, more often than not, it cannot be easily um, in a straightforward way, find the source. Especially, uh, buildings are, are mostly um, multi uh, high rise, multi story buildings. And uh, sometimes it involves more than one dripping air conditioner. I do think that we will have to look into it very carefully before we decide whether it's feasible. Mr. Chong, Mr. Chong, you have made a suggestion and the Secretary has answered. And it is not a time for debate. Mr. Albert, Mr. Stephen Hall. 
Well, apart from、um, getting your hair wet, getting your clothes wet, dripping aircon on water dripping from one aircon to another is also a nuisance to your sleep at night. If you don't sleep well, there will be other social problems. And in the government's main reply, it says that.、Uh, Uh, upon receiving a complaint on dripping air conditioners, or when such is spotted during routine inspections, and when the, it is rectified after a verbal warning or advisory letters have been received, then is that's it. So, what about?、Uh, can you tell me how many days will it take? Three, five, seven days, or three months,、uh, five months, seven months before it's rectified, because. Well, if it's all over one month, we think it's unacceptable. Well,、um, well, when we issue verbal warning or or、um, advice to. Offending、um, premises, and、uh, whether it will be able to effectively resolve the situation,、uh, we are also asked whether we have the、uh, number of figures of such cases and how long it has taken for these cases to be resolved.、Uh, I my answer is that I don't have such figures, and I'm afraid you won't be happy with that. If we have to. Give you the answer. That means our officers will have to make detailed records whenever they deal with a case. I'm not saying that this is not the right way, but we have to weigh up the pros and cons when we deploy、uh, manpower to tackle cases. And as I've said, that、um, the 290 officers, apart from dealing with、uh, dripping air conditioners, they have to deal with other environmental hygiene issues. If what if I add that、uh, request. Then their workload will increase, and there will be an increase in demand of、uh, manpower. All I can say now is that、uh, we don't have the figures, Mr. Chan Hang Pen. Thank you. In each district, the FHD has about、uh, five to ten health inspectors. Now、uh, they have to、um, catch litter bugs. They have to、um, follow up on、uh, environmental hygiene black spots or、uh, inspect、uh, licensed premises. And on top of that, dripping air conditioners. There is always a, a list of priority. In summer, there are dripping air cons, and the FHD receive the、uh, complaints, and they have to sit on it until maybe、uh, autumn. The situation is abated because. Um, the weather has cooled down, not because of the, not because the problem has been resolved, and、uh, people are not happy with how the FHD handle、uh, these case,、uh, environmental hygiene cases. Say, for example, rodent or, or similar cases. Will the secretary consider、uh, delegating part of the、um, services, say, for example, municipal, municipal services, to the chairman of Uh, the air of、um, the area, or even the superintendent of the FHD. We have to consider this in different perspectives. When it comes to district level affairs, the government has indeed、uh, adopted a pilot approach to delegate some of the work to. Uh, the district council, but when it comes to this kind of cases, it will be、uh, a holistic、um, consideration, not just about dripping air conditioners. And when we're asked about whether we have sufficient manpower, I must say that this is also close to my heart. We are constantly reviewing. Uh, manpower when dealing with、uh, relevant or related cases, not just、uh, dripping air conditioners, but also environmental hygiene problems. Whether we have sufficient manpower and we- how we can improve it, as a responsible policy bureau, when necessary and if possible, we will try to get more resources. But as the member has also pointed out,、uh, even when we have sufficient resources. Where do we accord、uh, the priori- priority? As Mr. Ho said,、uh, 
this is a big problem, and I understand that. But there are other issues, say, for example, food safety. I will be more concerned about them. Mr. Wu Ji Wai. Thank you. The graffiti uh, of the nuisance, I'm sure the Secretary is very clear about it. In the second part of his reply, he has uh, set out the difficulties faced by the Department in the investigation. The Secretary kept saying that uh, there are a lot of work of the Department and relying on the inspectors is not a law. But for the buildings, but for the housing department, is the same. Say, for example, illegal. Um, uh, for the buildings department, is the same. Say, for example, illegal structure. Because well, they have outsourced uh, the work of identifying um, dripping air conditioners because uh, it, the cases, the number of cases peak in summer. So will you seriously deal with it? Don't tell me that you have to rely on health inspectors to deal with the cases. Will you consider outsourcing um, the investigation of dripping air conditioners so that uh, the work will be more effective? But well, whether it is to increase directly manpower within the FVHD or treating this problem as a separate issue and outsource it, I think is all down to resources. Uh, for private housing estates or public housing estates, as I've said, we have. Um, Launch some targeted measures. We cooperate with private housing estates or public housing estates. The I the idea itself is similar to that of Mr. Wu's. We let uh, a, a more res more directly responsible uh, body to handle it. Say, for example, uh, the housing department if it's public housing estate, and um, um, property management companies if it's a private one. Is proved to be effective to a certain extent through the as a cooperation scheme. We empower PMAs by giving them the knowledge and the, the skills so that they can handle problems within their residential estates because it may be more efficient and effective. And so we have adopted the same idea. My question has not been answered because I was asking uh, what government, what the government has to to uh, to tackle the problem and whether they will increase resources. I think you've heard it right. We've spent uh, 23 minutes on this question. The third question, Mr. Tang Kapio. Thank you, Mr. President. Under the Mandatory Provident Fund Schemes Ordinance, an employer may use the accrued benefits derived from the contributions he made for an employee to a Mandatory provident fund scheme to offset severance pay or long service pay payable to the employee under the employment ordinance. Uh, the offsetting arrangement, in short, although the chief executive indicated that in his in his election manifesto as early as 2012 that he would progressively reduce the proportion of offsetting amount, the government has not put forward any specific proposal for filling the patch. And the offsetting arrangement has been incessantly knowing the accrued benefits payable to employees. On that hand, a number of employee gr employer groups have reacted strongly to the reports that the government intends to propose abolition of offsetting arrangement in the 2016 policy address. In this connection, the government informed this Council 1 whether the authorities have conducted studies on the abolition of offsetting arrangement. If they have, of the details, not reasons for that, whether the authorities have considered drawing up a timetable for the abolition of offsetting arrangement. Two. Whether the authorities have approached employers groups and labor organizations to gain understanding of the specific views on abolition of office arrangement, if so of the views the efforts made by the authorities to reduce the differences between them and whether they have put forward any proposal acceptable to both sides, nor to whether they will make efforts to gain any understanding of the views of both sides and see. Uh, given that some academics have proposed that uh, when introducing legislative amendment to, the to abolish the offsetting arrangement, the government should impose a five-year transition period in which employers are allowed to claim reimbursement from the government 
uh, for the extra amount which originally could have been withdrawn from the employees' MPF accounts for settling SPs, MSPs, whether the authority to study the feasibility of proposal. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. The government's reply to Ms. Tang's questions as follows. The offsetting of the severance pay and long service payments against the group benefits arising from employees' contribution to mandatory provident fund involves the interest of various stakeholders. Introducing changes to the existing arrangement affect the retirement benefits of employees and the operating costs of employers, especially those of the SMEs. At present, the community has not yet reached any consensus. The government has all along been attaching great importance and listening very carefully to views of different sectors of the community, especially employees and employees on the offsetting arrangement. Earlier on in the Legco's panel on financial affairs and panel on Mel and Manpower, held a joint meeting to gauge views of deputations from different sectors, including a number of labor groups, employers and business organizations on the offsetting arrangement. The views of the employers and employees, as expressed at the meeting, were sharply divergent. Now, the labor sector was concerned that the offsetting arrangement would reduce accrued benefits for employees and strongly called for abol abolishing the offsetting mechanism as soon as possible so as to enhance retirement protection for employees. On the other hand, employer groups considered that the offsetting mechanism represented a consensus reached after extensive consultation when the MPF arrangement was passed into law. Employers groups agreed to the support uh, agreed to support the implementation of the system because the government clearly stipulated a bill to permit offsetting of SP LSP by accrued benefits arising from employers' contribu uh, contributions. They maintain that the abolition would not only amount to a, a, a breach of the consensus stand, but would also increase employees' financial burden and impact significantly on the business environment of MEs in particular. They therefore strongly objected to the abolition of the offsetting mechanism. The government notes that different sectors of the community have recently actively expressed through different channels their respective views and suggestions. The current retirement protection system has four pillars, one of which is the MPF. As such, the offsetting arrangement of MPF is related to retirement protection. There has all along been a substantial body of opinion in the community that the retirement protection function of MPF should be strengthened. The Commission on Poverty will launch a six-month public consultation on retirement protection in December this year. We will, in, the, we will in that context, consult different sectors on matters that, re that render the MPF not being able to discharge its inherent retirement functions, such as offsetting arrangement. On completion of the consultation, government will analyze and study in detail the views collected and examine it, uh, the issues holistically. We will maintain an open mind in listening to different views and will very prudent uh, will be very prudent in considering any proposal that involves the use of government funds. We hope that both employees and employees I uh, will consider the matter from a holistic point of view and be s sympathetic and accommodating uh, in the spirit of reaching common ground while accepting each other's uh, different view. I hope the employers and employees could through inclusive and rational discussion, build consensus, and forge greatest possible mutual understanding tackling the issues. The Secretary says that it's hoped that the uh, consensus can be reached and there will be mutual, uh, com mutual accommodation and uh, the, um, both sides will be sympathetic, but will the executive and the legislature be, uh, be sympathetic and, com and accommodating? Now, have you respect our strong views? Because after a few months, the council uh, will uh, be um, will come to the end of the term. We we have been asking for a consultation. Is the consultation too late? Now, in fact, you are self-contradictory. Now, you said that the community has no consensus, but in paragraph 3, you said that you will consult uh, different sectors on the matters that render the MPF not being able to discharge its inherent retirement protection, such as the offsetting arrangement. So apart from part of the business sector, uh, the professionals, the uh, funds, the labor sector of the view that the, M the offsetting arrangement render the MPF not being able to discharge inherent retirement protection. Is it because uh, in the government there are different uh, officials in the sector which favor the business sector, therefore there is, uh, this is not moving forward? I thank the member for the concern. This term of the government is very uh, serious in following the matter up. We have not dodged the issue. We have a clear timetable. 
and that in the consultation which will be launched at the end of this year, um, uh, we will attach importance to this in the consultation. Now you say that the term of the Let's Go will be uh, at the end of July uh, this year, but this term of the government uh, will come to um, an end only um, in um, 2017, end of 2017. So um, in the consultation period, we will um, do a lot of work. We will try to understand the situation, collect data, so that uh, the community will have an informed discussion. Let's uh, consider uh, so as to consider, uh, consider way forward. Once there is a consensus, we'll move forward. But he has not answered my question. Is there any consensus within the government? Uh, do you have a consensus? With Professor Chan is dragging his feet for three years. Well, uh, concerning the administration, the administration is concerned. I speak on behalf of the administration, not just myself. Uh, Mr. Andrew Leung. Now the CE, uh, Mr. President, the CE, in his uh, manifesto said that he um, uh, told the labor sector that the, the, the uh, offsetting uh, would be introduced gradually. But we have pointed out that in forming, in forming new, uh, enacting new laws, the government has to consider the impact on the SMEs. I asked the administration whether it has looked into the uh, abolition of offsetting arrangement and its impacts on the overall economy and also the uh, impact on the SMEs and in particular um, uh, labor relations. Has there been long uh, detailed assessment um, now, with regard to uh, drawing a uh, consensus, how, how, how is the administration going to do that before they incorporate the proposal in the um, policy address? Now, with regard to retirement protection and offsetting, it's a very complicated issue, and there is a historical background to that. In 1974, there was the uh, SP, and then followed by LSP some years later, and there was no retirement protection. Uh, the government at that time encouraged employers and employees to uh, reach an agreement on, uh, re uh, on um, the, the, the um, leaving arrangement. And then uh, there was also the offsetting arrangement in drawing up the MPF system. Now, 20 years uh, have elapsed, and there has been a lot of change. There have been a lot of changes. And there are con uh, contract out workers, and there is. Uh, we know uh, th there are grounds uh, on the part of the employers, but we also need to consider the um, issue raised by the employees. We need, to, we need to deal with it very carefully. We cannot be hasty. We cannot rush. We need to find a consensus to come to um, a, uh, the agreement that the road um, uh, is equally acceptable, the way that is equally acceptable by both sides. We need uh, to have objective data. We need to make a decision. Uh, according to the uh, objective uh, uh, objective data. In the coming six uh, months, uh, there will be in-depth consultation and also discussion. We agree there should be data. We sh agree that there, we, there should be studies. Dr. Fernando Chung. Mr. President, Mr. President, with regard to the MPF, according to the MPFA's uh, web page, it's all about retirement protection. I cannot see how Offsetting arrangement is related to retirement protection, and only offsetting will only undermine retirement protection. As said by Mr. Andrew Leung in the manifesto of the CEE, he claims that he would uh, gradually um, reduce the proportion of off offsetting amount. Now, in the reply by the secretary, he is just a middleman. He asks uh, the employers and employees to come to a con consensus and be sympathetic and accommodating towards each other. Not yet, the CE um, in his uh, manifesto said that there would it would be gradually the offset would be uh, gradually reduced. Now he since the secretary speaks on behalf of the whole executive, is it the executive's position? that offsetting will be gradually reduced. What have you done to honor this promise? Mr. President, I've already said, that very, uh, said very clearly that at the end of the year, there will be a consultation, and we will bring up this issue. 
The MPF system is one of the four pillars, an important pillar, and offsetting is a common concern. To make the MPF system to be effective in providing retirement protection, the issue has to be tackled. Um, uh, there will be a chance for different parties to express their views, and after the consultation, we can analyze the situation and consider the way forward. As for the CE's uh, promise, is still there. It's not that uh, he is going to quit uh, to 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 um, disown his promise, uh, but uh, we need to find consensus, and the government, of course, will take the lead. Mr. Li Chaoyan, Mr. President. According to the secretary, he is sincere. He has been working hard on this, but in fact, he is seriously helping C Y Leung to dodge his promise. Uh, at the uh, policy uh, at the Q and A session, I asked C Y Leung to honor his promise, but uh, but uh, we can see from the secretary's reply that um, C Y Leung continue to dodge the issue. Now he has not uh, the C the, the uh, Siwa Leung's government has not done anything, and then we still have to wait for six months of consultation. And after consultation, the council will has come uh, will be um, disbanded. The legislative council will be disbanded because of the uh, end of the term. And then uh, after um, uh, in the middle of 2016, there will be a report. There is no legislative timetable. What is the question? I want to ask the secretary then. You have your responsibility, don't you? Uh, 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 your responsibility is not is not to prepare for the candidate, uh, not prepare for the manifesto of the candidate for the next term of the CE. Uh, time, what is the time? You, uh, there is no time. Uh, the candidate may just say he will abolish. Please do not, please do not uh, give a speech. Mr. Matthew Chung, now you, you are receiving salaries. You are with, uh, working in this term. Why you put a duty on you for the, the re-election of the candidate of the next term? You have no such responsibility. Uh, Mr. Lee, please do not give a speech. I've already asked the question. Have you heard uh, the question? He is not doing his work. You're very. He is just preparing the manifesto for the candidate of next term. Therefore, uh, he continues to um, dodge his promise. Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, people can see that we are working on this um, in a concrete manner. In the consultation period, if there is any consensus, if there is any direction, if employers and employees consider that certain easy, uh, certain. Uh, measures can be considered, then we will continue to uh, move ahead. My question has not been answered. So is he preparing uh, the, the way for the next time of the government? Um, I think your question is an allegation against the secretary, and he has already responded to that. Mr. Frankie Yick. Thank you, Mr. President. His main reply in the uh, uh, later part of his second paragraph, the Sri has said that they maintain that the abolition of offsetting mechanism um, will not amount to a breach of the would amount to will not only amount to a breach of the consensus stand, but would also increase employers' financial burden and impact significantly on the uh, business environment, FMEs in particular. Now, you speak on behalf of the government, Mr. Secretary. Is it because? Of the uh, part of the manifesto of the CE's election, that you are overturning the um, undertaking of the previous term of the government. The uh, secretary, I said that there is a historical background to that. It's very complicated. The law allows offsetting uh, 20 years ago, and also the law also allowed the also schemes. And uh, it's also put down in the employment. Employees' ordinance, or I beg pardon, it's also put in the employment ordinance. Now, after 20 years, the labour market uh, has changed. There, there has been uh, a lot of contracting out. With contracting out, if um, 
with regard to the uh, grassroots, the junior employees, with many offsetting, there is not much left uh, in the MPF. Uh, and the employers are equally right in uh, their arguments. We need to find a solution to that. We want to find a solution that is affordable uh, by the employers and also will protect the employees. We need consultation. Therefore, we need consultation. In the coming consultation, uh, we hope that the community can discuss the issue and we can come up with different packages. And if there are good proposals, we'll look into that. Uh, we uh, have an open mind and we're humble in looking at that. Now, Mr. Yik, I think the Secretary has already answered your question. If you have further questions, please find another channel to raise that. Mr. Wong Kohei. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Secretary. Now you successfully uh, implemented um, the paternity leave law. First, the government took the lead, and then followed by legislation. The government took the lead in providing paternity leave, and then the government came with come up with legislation. Now, will you start with the? Uh, uh, Legislative Council say, with regard to the employment of uh, member assistance to legal members, there was no dispute about offsetting. Why can't the administration take the lead, abolish offsetting, just like um, introducing paternity leave in government departments? Why can't you um, bring it into? Um, the uh, government and use it uh, and set a good example. As for consulting employers and employees, we really don't know when uh, that will it will bear fruit. Shouldn't the government start among itself uh, first, within itself first? You have already answered your question. Thank you, Mr. Wong, for the question. At the present stage, the administration has no intention to take the lead. But it doesn't mean, and it doesn't rule out the possibility that with new development, the government will receive, revisit this position. We need to understand that the most important thing is not about the government because the government has not employed uh, many of these uh, people. I think the only issue, uh, the, the main issue, is in the business sector because of the contracting out, and we need to consider the affordability of uh, the. Of the business sector. There will be a consultation for six months, beginning from the end of this year. And after much discussion, we may be able to find common points and we may be able to iron out the details. You must give some time to the government to do with that. Mr. President, the Secretary has not answered the question with regard to the EC bit, uh, which has no. Uh, this bill. So why can't he introduce that? Why can't the government introduce that? Now, at the present stage, we have no intention to do that. But it doesn't mean that in the future we will not do that. We, at the present stage, we we'll focus our attention on the consultation, the main issue. If there is no intention, is it the reason? It is not uh, reasonable. Now, Mr. Wong, we cannot engage in a debate if you have some views on. Uh, the state uh, position of the secretary, you can take that up with him in the uh, antechamber. Mr. Pun Siu Peng. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Tang Ka Piu uh, raised the point uh, that uh, some academics may propose a uh, five year transitional arrangement. Now, the secretary said that he is aware of the views of different sectors. And he has also agreed that there is. That he has also stressed that there is a big gap between employers and employees on offsetting, or, or arrangement. In fact, the academic's proposal is a way to narrow down the gap. Will the proposal be put before the LAB for discussion? If employers and employees accept the proposal, then will the administration accept the uh, off, uh, abolishing the offsetting arrangement? Now, in the consultation period. We will consult the LAB and relevant unions and employers associations. We cannot. Uh, we are not doing a simple consultation. We will conduct a wide, in-depth, informed discussion, uh, so as to find a way that is acceptable to both sides. Uh, Ms. Chen Yunhan, I'm really uh, infuriated uh, in listening to the reply. Now there are disputes. 
and the employers and employees are bound to be in dispute. What have you been? What, what have you been doing for three and a half years? We have seven rounds of uh, consultations. Uh, what is the administration doing? Uh, Mr. President, I'm going to ask a question. He is really an idiot. Now, please ask your question. Now, since you know that there are many contracting out workers, and after much many offsets, uh, there is not much money left in the MPF. The government has the biggest number of contracting out staff. It's just hypocritical. Why can't the government take the lead? Your contracting out employees uh, will have these offsetting arrangements abolished. Well, you're just repeating Mr. Walcott Hing's question. Well, I'm not. Please sit down, the secretary. I think um, I've already answered Mr. Walcott Hing's question. At the present stage, um, we have no intention to do that. But things may change after consultation. Well, during the consultation, there may be new ideas after wide discussion. And if there is a consensus, the government does not uh, exclude the possibility of changing our position. We've spent more, nearly 23 minutes on the question. Question number four, Dr. Elizabeth Quart. Thank you, President. Recently, a 19-year-old young girl in a critical condition suffering from pulmonary hypertension died while waiting in vain for suitable lungs for transplant. Also, only at the last, meeting, last minute did a 46-year-old with liver failure receive a liver transplant to gain a new lease of life. It lets me report that the organ donation rate in Hong Kong is lower than those in other regions. In 2011, there were about 35 deceased organ donors per million population PMP in Spain, 17 donors PMP in the EU, but less than 5 donors PMP in Hong Kong. While the demand for organ transplant in Hong Kong has been increasing, over, increasing year after year, Organs available for transplant are in acute shortage. In this connection, will the government inform this council A, as there are currently only 140, 174,000 registrations recorded on the centralized organ donation register? How the authorities will step up efforts in promoting the message of organ donation and whether they will arrange staff to proactively approach members of the public at places where they apply for identity cards, passports, driving licenses, and public library cards and donate blood to invite them to consider signing an organ donation card if they will of the details, if not the reasons for that, too, as there are currently only nine organ transplant coordinators in Hong Kong who are responsible for liaison work on organ transplant matters at around 40 public hospitals throughout Hong Kong, whether the authorities will increase the manpower such that at least one coordinator is provided for each public and private hospital, so that apart from persuading families or persons who have just passed away to donate organs of the disease, they would, may also devote more efforts in promoting organ donation among staff, patients, etc. in hospitals and conduct registration for them, if they will of the details, if not the reasons for that, and three, whether it would implement a new policy to increase organ donation rate, such as by stipulating that where deceased persons have not raised any objection before death to organ donation, they will be deemed to have, be, to have given consent to donate their organs for transplant after death, as well as enacting legislation to provide that organ donation costs have a legal effect similar to that of wills, in, in that unless the signers have changed their minds before death, or other persons, including their families, do not have the right to object after the signers have passed away to the donation of their organs for transplant. It will will of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Food and Health, President for patients suffering from end-stage organ failure, organ transplant is their hope for gaining a new life. Organ transplants in Hong Kong, be it from a cadaveric or living or donations, are subject to regu regulation under the Human Organ Transplant Ordinance, which aims mainly to ensure that no commercial dealing is involved in the organs for transplant. Organ donation and transplant and eventually whether patients can be saved depend on a number of factors. The hospital authority, HA, has put in place mechanism to handle and coordinate the clinical aspects involved in the process. However, one of the most important factors which is beyond our control is the attitude of the general public towards organ donation. In this regard, it is government's policy to gradually uh, inculcate a 
culture of organ donation in the community with a view to reducing reluctance or hesitation of individuals and family members in donating organs. Hong Kong has seen an overall increase in organ donation rate. It rose from about a 4 donors PMP in 2005 to about 6.1 PMP in 2013, which is higher than that of other developed economies in Asia, such as Malaysia, 0 0.5, and Japan, 0 0.66 but remains lower than some Western countries. Organ donation rate is affected by a number of factors, including demographic structure and death rates, attitude of individuals and their family members, and clinical factors. Given the differences in background, customs, culture, individual circumstances, it is not appropriate to simply compare the organ donation rate of Hong Kong with other regions. Our, my, our reply to the very parts of the question is as follows. A, at present, members of the public may register their wish to, do, or, to donate organs after death through the Centralized Organ Donation Register, CODR, managed by the Department of Health by mail or through Internet. Currently, more than 179,000 registrations are recorded in the CODR. Besides, members of the public can uh, carry signed donation organ donation cards or express their wish to healthcare workers. In the event that a deceased uh, person has not indicated his or her wish by signing the organ donation card or regist registering in the CODR, his or her organ can still be donated to save lives with the consent of the family members concerned. To impress upon the general public uh, the importance of uh, organ donation and to gradually inculcate a culture that is uh, receptive to and uh, appreciative of organ donation. The DH has been making promotional efforts on different fronts in collaboration with the HA and the non-governmental organ governmental organizations. The DH launched the CODR in November 2008 to encourage the public to register their wish to donate their organs after death. In recent years, the DH has introduced an IT platform to facilitate members of the public to register as organ donors. The DH has also taken the following promotional measures. A, establishing an institution-based network by inviting public bodies, private companies, and NGOs to work in collaboration with the government to promote organ donation and to encourage registration in the CODR in institutions. There are currently over 300 supporting organizations. B, enhancing public understanding and acceptability of organ donation through public education activities such as exhibition and seminars. In the past three years, DH organized about 170 seminars and exhibitions in various places such as hospitals, government buildings and offices, immigration towers, etc. C. Launching promotional activities on television, radio, the internet and other media. And D. Encouraging public participation through electronic means such as setting up an organ donation Facebook fan page and enhance the promotion of organ donation among the younger generation. Since 2008, we have uh, distributed more than 2.1 million leaflets with CODR registration forms. The DH has also uh, arranged distribution of promotional leaflets and CODR registration forms at blood donor centers. We would uh, consider arranging distribution of such promotional leaflets or materials at other locations. To recognize the charitable acts of organ donors and their families, the government has established the Garden, Garden of Life in Kowloon Park. Characterized by special landscape and architecture, the design of the garden echoes the theme, light up lives of organ donation. Over the years, DH has organized various activities to celebrate the anniversaries of the launch of CODR and further promote organ donation to celebrate the seventh anniversary of the launch of CODR, the DH will, in collaboration with Hong Kong Medical Association, the HA, Hong Kong Society of Transplantation and Hong Kong Liver Trans Foundation, organize talks in November to further promote to further promoting registration for organ donation among the public through joint efforts with primary care doctors. To the duties of transplant coordinators of the HA including the following three areas. One, approach families of a brain stem dead patients who may be potential donors and explain to them the details of donor of organ donation in the hope that they would uh, give consent to donate organs of the disease. Two, with the HA to promote organ donation among healthcare staff to raise their awareness of it. Three, provide support and coordination for external or organ donation promotional activities. At present, the HA has seven transplant coordinators. Regarding the work of approaching families of brain stem dead patients mentioned in item one above, effective contacts have generally been made. As for items two and three, the HA has recently increased the establishment to nine transplant coordinators in 2015-2016 to strengthen internal and external promotion of organ donation. As such work virtually requires various professional community partners, including the DH and other interested community and professional groups to collaborate, transplant coordinators play a supportive and coordinating role 
to create a positive atmosphere for organ donation in the whole community. The HA would review the effectiveness of the latest enhancement and the manpower of transplant or coordinators as appropriate. Three, the government seeks to enhance public understanding and acceptance of organ donation through different approaches, including strengthening education and publicity. Adopting a legislative approach like drawing on uh, overseas experience to introduce mechanisms such as automatic organ donation or opting out systems or to provide organ donation cards with legal effect so that it can form part of a view are very different from the existing organ donation regime. Under the existing regime, family members of organ donors have the right to refuse the request for organ donation on behalf of the donors. We must respect their wishes. Before implementing any new proposals, we should ensure that they are acceptable to the public and a fair, transparent and widely acceptable mechanism will be developed. We will continue to discuss with professional sectors and interest parties in the light of the recent discussions on organ donation in the community and duly consult the public before making any substantial changes to the existing regime. The government plans to assess more in depth the public's understanding and acceptance of organ donation via the government's thematic household survey. In the meantime, the DH will continue to step up its efforts in promoting organ donation. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. Dr. Elizabeth Kwok, President, on a daily basis, uh, 2,500 patients are suffering from various disease and uh, struggling uh, at the brink of death. Organ donation is their only hope to regain the new needs of life. The DAB has been promoting organ donation in 20. 12, 2015, we conducted uh, questionnaire surveys. Some 23% of the respondents uh, had signed a, a card, and 45% uh, said they would. Uh, the, the findings in the two uh, surveys were similar. But in this, but this year, 54% of uh, the respondents said that if invited, they would sign an organ donation card. Compared with the, that of 2014, it's an increase of 14%. Uh, so if you take the initiative to invite them to sign an organ donation card, you can achieve a very significant result. Life is precious. So my question is, has the government exhausted all means to win over public support and sign organ donation cards? In my main question, I ask whether you have taken the initiative to contact the public in service centers of various nature. Are you going to come up with a new mechanism to to extend the reach? And the re reply is that uh, they will look into this. I would like to get a more substantive reply from the uh, Secretary as regard what actually will be done. Secretary, I think the main part of the question is uh, we should consider uh, exploring new channels and avenues to the reach out to potential uh, donors. We should make it convenient for uh, these people to uh, to get in touch with us or to get access to the information. We would uh, consider to, uh, to, to distribute and leave less uh, at locations where we haven't been able to serve because uh, the DH uh, leave less uh, it has a, a form attached to it. If you are given a leaflet and if the, the person finds it agreeable, they can sign the form and return the form to the DH through various channels, and we have, we have uh, dedicated people to get in touch with the person concerned to clarify his uh, wish and also to uh, clarify certain uh, things uh, before registration is completed. Uh, how would the secretary explore the new channels, and how would uh, uh, the, the, those uh, new procedures be implemented? If um, Dr. Kwok is looking at a new channel, a possible new channel. As I mentioned in the last part of my reply, we will work with the relevant professional bodies and we will involve them in a discussion. We have to try to ascertain whether their views have changed over the years. I've said time and again that more than 10 years ago that there was a discussion with the the public and the professional sectors, and uh, they did not quite accept uh, anything which would be in 
uh, which will be involuntary. So uh, we will discuss the matter again with the professional bodies and through the uh, census and statistics departments of thematic household survey, we try to assess more in depth the public's understanding and acceptance of uh, organ donation. Uh, Dr. Joseph Lee. Thank you, President. In the May reply, in respect of uh, organ donation, he says uh, 2.1 2 million forms have been distributed, and we have uh, 180,000 uh, people registered. So it's a registration rate of 9%. Have you got statistics starting from 2008? And that is uh, for those on the donor's list. Uh, are there any particular uh, Age profile information. Are you going to promote uh, organ pro uh, donations uh, in respect of different age groups? Secretary, I don't have any information with me with regard to the age profile of uh, donors. I can uh, provide the information later. But at the same time, personally speaking, whether uh, uh, at in the HA, or in certain professional bodies, or the work through the work of the DH, I have been uh, involved in the past uh, t twenty, thirty years in uh, the organ donation promotion. I, I would say that we reach out to a wide sector of uh, potential uh, donors and groups. To promote this among young people, we have been using the IT platforms. If we know that for a particular age group, we need to do more, we will step up our efforts targeting in a focused manner the publicity for that particular group. I would like the Secretary to give us the statistics and also to tell us more about uh, whether there will be a focus uh, uh, measures for different age groups. Secretary, well, I will provide the information uh, if uh, available. Mr. Chen Chichun, I very much support uh, organ donation. I signed an organ donation card when I was at a, at a, at a school. I only realized that uh, it can, we can uh, register through the internet. I hope that the secretary will promote this uh, to the all electrical members and their ward offices. In Hong Kong, there are certain restrictions on uh, blood donation. For example, male homosexuals, and that is uh, people who have had uh, sex with men, uh, would be regarded as in not suitable as not suitable blood do donors for life. Do you have a similar restriction on organ donation? If uh, there is, I have to re cancel my registration. If not, why is there a difference between the blood donation and uh, organ donation? For this moment, I don't know the answer, but I know that uh, for organ donation, they have different uh, conditions uh, for different organs. And uh, the conditions or requirements are evolving over time. So there's no uh, one fixed set of uh, criteria. I'll try to uh, take out relevant information and uh, provide the information to Mr. Chen afterwards. Uh, Ms. Tari Lee, we want to m make uh, organ donation uh, part of uh, the, uh, the popular the mentality. As Mr. Kwok has said, uh, we had those incidents. We should see the opportunity uh, arising from those incidents uh, to promote organ donation. In the community, there are two uh, lines of thinking. Some are, some are saying that we should uh, introduce an opt-out mechanism. And second, we should turn this uh, organ donation card as uh, and as uh, a part of uh, the will, and that is, is to say the family members uh, will not be able to have the right to object. But I think this, the second one is more acceptable to the Chinese uh, culture. Would you consider doing this, Secretary? 
uh, the first one. Uh, I can't remember the order. Uh, he was saying that uh, we should uh, regard the do organ donation card as part of the will. Then uh, the well, we are going to raise this in the coming uh, discussions uh, when we talk to the uh, professional bodies to see if it's acceptable. Turning to the uh, opt-out mechanism or, or proposed opt-out mechanism. Y oh, yes, I, I'm going to also take this on take on board this idea in the survey and in the coming discussions. But if you ask me whether I have any reservation, I would say yes. I have reservations because the in the mainstream the medical sector, we have been saying that we should uh, make sure that organ donation is voluntary. If we look at uh, places where they have uh, introduced this to boost the donation rate, uh, they have achieved a uh, uh, different results in Spain. Uh, they have uh, managed to raise the uh, donation rate, but uh, in Singapore, where they have this mechanism, the organ donation rate is not high. So laws uh, on such a mechanism uh, is uh, effective uh, or not. Is something that would have to uh, that that's dependent on the local culture. So we have to look into that in further detail. Doctor Kwokake, a nineteen-year-old girl died because uh, she failed to failed to get uh, an, a donated organ for transplant. That's very sad. But uh, over the tw past twenty years, on the part of the government, uh, the, the efforts have just. Uh, Managed to achieve a, a 2.5 percent rate of registration as donors. Well, if we have been uh, successful in our efforts, we wouldn't be in such a difficult position now. In the past ten years, how much additional investment uh, was made by the government to promote this? And if uh, the current uh, arrangement is not working well, what else can the government do, or will the government do? To revitalize uh, the uh, mechanism, because the government has been uh, doing a sloppy job, and it's very difficult to uh, gain access to publicity material through the media on on organ donation. Secretary, if we want to increase the organ donation rate so that more patients can gain a new lease of life through Organs donated is the common goal of um, many professional people and the government, and is the, a joint enterprise for them. If you say the government has not done enough, well, we are, we can uh, we are we can accept uh, criticism. But you say that we are doing a sloppy uh, job, uh, notwithstanding the joint efforts of many professional bodies and uh, the government. Uh, I would say it is not fair to those uh, uh, organizations. We would like to inculcate a value whereby organ is donated. Uh, out of goodwill, and we also want to change, order the culture among the public, and also to the reduce the hesitations of uh, family members in donating uh, the organs of their deceased family members. As I've said in the past. Ten to twenty years, I play a part in this, 
and uh, these professional sectors and the government have been uh, stepping up efforts all the way. Through a, a recent survey, we know that the hesitation is not so much about uh, do donating one's own organs, but to make a decision on behalf of a, a deceased family member. So I think our efforts should focus on uh, the mechanism to make it convenient. For example, some members have said that it's difficult to get a registration form and uh, uh, people don't know how to get registered. And also, more importantly, the donor, the registered donor, should tell the family about uh, his or her wish. So we are going to improve our work uh, along these lines. And of course, we don't rule out uh, introducing other mechanisms. But we must insist that whatever we do, we respect uh, the wish of the deceased or their family members. Uh, presidents, I put a very clear question to Secretary. He may not have the information to reply now, and that is the additional resources uh, invested in the past ten years to promote or to uh, to get more people registered as uh, organ donors. Secretary, I'll try to find from our records uh, how how much uh, was done, but uh, the information will not be complete, as I've said. Apart from the government, this is also uh, a joint effort of uh, professional uh, bodies and NGOs, and they have been working hard in the past ten odd years. So the information uh, that may not be uh, contained in the government records. That's a We've spent more than twenty-five minutes on this question. Question five, Mr. Chen Hempen. Mr. President, the solicitation on the streets, on street solicitation, by sex workers coming to Hong Kong from mainland to engage in prostitution activities has caused great distress to residents of certain districts over the years. The authorities have conducted numerous law enforcement operations, but with little effect. Some residents have relayed to me that their daily lives, as well as the overall image of the community, have been adversely affected. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the number of law enforcement operations conducted against on-street solicitation in each of the five past five years, whether the authorities have monitored if uh, on-street solicitation revived after the law enforcement operations, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. The number of cases in which uh, prosecutions were instituted against the owners who let their flats to other persons for the purpose of prostitution in each of the five, past five years, as well as the effectiveness of such prosecution actions. Two, given that on-street solicitation continues to exist despite repeated crackdowns, whether the authorities will consider raising the penalties by amending the legislation for greater deterrent effect and introducing new measures for curbing such activities, if they will consider of the details, if not the reasons for that, whether they have plans to step up investigations to crack down on crime syndicates that control prostitution by sex workers so as to reduce on-street solicitation, if they have such plans of the details, if not the reasons for that. And three, of the number of visitors to Hong Kong arrested in each of the past five years for engaging in prostitution activities, and among them, the number of persons who were engaged in on-street solicitation whether the authorities have stepped up interception of persons suspected to be entering Hong Kong for engaging in prostitution activities, if they have of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Security. President, the police are highly concerned about and are committed to the combat of illegal prostitution. The primary objectives of police enforcement actions are to prevent exploitation of others for the purposes of prostitution, combat organized prostitution activities and lessen the burden to members of the public that vice activities may cause. The act of prostitution itself is not illegal. The targets of police actions are people who control sex workers for prostitution and keep vice establishments 
instead of sex workers, unless the latter are involved in other offences, including soliciting for an immoral purpose in public places or breaching the conditions of stay. In addition to stepping up patrols by uniformed officers at black spots, the police have been taking intelligence-led enforcement operations. The police will, having regard to the law and order, as well as manpower situation in each district, continue to tackle the problem in a vigorous manner. My reply to various parts of the Honourable Chair's questions is as follows, one and two. There are a number of provisions in the current legislation in Hong Kong that may be invoked against the crimes of controlling of prostitution by conferring adequate enforcement power under law enforcement agencies. Related offences that are stipulated under Part 12 of the Crimes Ordinance, Cap 200, include control over persons for the purpose of unlawful sexual intercourse or prostitution, living on earnings of prostitution of others, causing prostitution and keeping a vice establishment. The maximum penalty of the above offences ranges from a fine of $10,000 and imprisonment of six months to imprisonment of 14 years. The police have all along been taking proactive enforcement actions against such offences and for the purpose of tackling cross-border organised prostitution activities, maintain contact and exchange intelligence with law enforcement agencies outside Hong Kong. Furthermore, as a deterrence to the legal act of soliciting for an immoral purpose in public places, the police shall, in addition to stepping up patrol and re relevant black spots, take intelligence-led enforcement actions. Figures of persons erected by the, arrested by the police for being involved in procuring, controlling or controlling of prostitution and keeping a vice establishment in the past five years are at Annex 1. The police do not maintain statistics on the number of anti-vice operations conducted. With re regard to the premises connected with the keeping of a vice establishment, the police shall keep a close watch on the activities therein and issue warnings to the owners where appropriate reminding them that it is against the law to permit their premises to be used for habitual prostitution. Under the Crimes Ordinance, any person who permits or lets premises for use as a vice establishment shall be charged with the offence of letting premises for use as a vice establishment, tenant, etc., permitting premises or vessel to be kept as a vice establishment or tenant, etc., permitting premises or vessel to be used for prostitution and shall be liable on conviction to a maximum imprisonment of seven years. In the past five years, there were a total of 17 prosecutions involving the above three offences, among which 11 were convicted. Furthermore, if the offence of keeping a vice establishment or one of the three offences mentioned above is committed within a specified period, and such an offence is connected with the same premises, the police may apply to the court for a closure order under Section 153A of the Crimes Ordinance to close the premises in question for six months as a deterrent to tenants, occupiers or persons in charge of the premises. We note that illegal prostitution may also involve other unlawful acts such as operation of an unlicensed guest house, illegal alteration of a unit and breach of conditions of stay. In this connection, the police may launch a joint operation with other relevant departments depending on the circumstances and needs and may adjust their strategies as appropriate for effective law enforcement. Three, the Immigration Department, MD, is committed to the combat and prevention of acts in breach of the conditions of stay by people coming to Hong Kong as visitors, including taking up unlawful employment involving sex work. The measures and enforcement actions taken by the MD are as follows. A. To scrutinize visit visa entry permit applications and reject applications if the applicant's purpose of visiting Hong Kong are found to be in doubt. B. To perform immigration control and various control points to prevent visitors from entering Hong Kong to engage in activities not commensurate with the conditions of stay. C. To enhance intelligence collection and initiate enforcement operations against doubtful intermediaries or agents 
D. To step off investigation and prosecution actions against persons engaging in acts in breach of the conditions of stay and also the intermediaries or agents which aid and abet them. E. To step up joint enforcement actions with other law enforcement agencies and F. To enhance publicity to remind the public that hiring illegal workers is a criminal offence and that employers have to inspect travel documents of non-Hong Kong permanent resident job seekers before hiring them and encourage the public to report illegal employment via hotline facsimile mail or online platform. With a view to effectively deterring mainland visitors from entering Hong Kong in an attempt to take up illegal employment, including take up un unlawful employment involving sex work, the MD will continue to exchange intelligence with the mainland authorities. Furthermore, in accordance with the established mechanism, the MD will pass the particulars of the convicted mainland residents to the mainland authorities concerned for cancellation of their exit endorsements and such residents shall be prohibited from visiting Hong Kong for two years. Any statistics of persons arrested for being suspected of taking up unlawful employment involving sex work in the past five years are at Annex 2. Visitors who are not prosecuted but reasonably suspected to have engaged in activities against the immigration ordinance will be subject to MD's examination upon their subsequent visits to Hong Kong. If their purposes of visiting Hong Kong are found to be in doubt, they will be refused entry and immediately removed from Hong Kong. MD handles each and every visit visa or entry permit application in a stringent manner and in accordance with prevailing policies. Applicants must meet normal immigration requirements, including having no criminal record, raising no security or criminal concerns to the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, and so forth, as well as meeting the relevant specific eligibility criteria before a visit visa or entry permit is considered. If the applicant has any adverse records or breaches, the MD will, in the light of individual circumstances, consider refusing the application. Thank you, President. Mr. Chen Han Pen. Mr. President, well, there are vice establishments. Um, in five years, there are just only 70 prosecutions. Is that number too small? You can go to many districts. You see there are red lights outside, and you know there are problems with these establishments or premises, and the, the, the residents have told me that they've actually reported their neighbours to uh, to be a vice establishment, or there are people coming on two-way permits engaging in illegal activity. Well, the police did take action, but um, they only arrested people on breach of conditions, say. So in the same unit, we see different groups of um, mainland women on two-way permits coming to work there. And uh, the resident was really bothered, and he's uh, very unhappy about the situation. So for allowing premises to be let out uh, as a vice establishment, uh, it, has the police been too passive in tackling such problem? And then uh, we see a high number of uh, mainland women coming to Hong Kong to engage in prostitution uh, on two-way permits. So would uh, the government do something, you know, when uh, these people are arrested or repatriated? Would you um, try inform their family members through the mainland security authorities so this will serve a deterrent effect on those trying to engage in such activities? Secretary. President, Mr. Chen referred to uh, the fact that there are 17 prosecution cases and um, in the past five years for procuring or controlling prostitution or keeping uh, he said the figure is on the low side. But I think we shouldn't just look at the prosecutions based on one piece of legislation. As I mentioned in the main reply, the police um, enforce law for certain purposes. Let's say uh, on a premises there's just one person, and then that is, if it's just one person, it's not against the law. But if that person, let's say, is a visitor, then we could... Um, enforce law on the basis of breach on conditions of stay, as mentioned by Mr. Chen. And also we worked, uh, we have a liaison with um, owners' corporations. If uh, the co corporations could uh, provide any information or leads to us, then we will take targeted action. And uh, this is an ongoing effort. Mr. Chen's second question, that is, whether the police will pass on information of those arrested to the mainland authorities and request the mainland authorities to 
inform the family members? Well, I think here, first of all, how the mainland authorities handle such cases in according is their mainland law. Well, we have to respect the way they deal with it because uh, the mainland has its own laws and regulations. Now, what we are doing now is that we'll inform the mainland authorities of these cases, and then the mainland authorities may also take action to prohibit these people from coming to Hong Kong at least for two years. As to whether further action could be taken, I believe we would have to leave that to the mainland authorities. My understanding is, um, when it comes to prostitution, the main authorities attach great importance to such problems. Uh, they also face the same problem, actually. So they do have a way to deal with that. Of course, in our um, interaction with mainland colleagues, we always have exchanges on the situation on both sides of the boundary. Mr. Lan Chi Cheng, thank you, President. While the um, um, Sex workers problem has um, been bothering the districts for a long time. At district councils, we often raise this issue for discussion with the police. We've also given our views to the police. Now, in Mr. Chan Han Ban's question, what I find is this. For the police districts and the immigration department, they have a tough task to tackle. I see uh, in past operations, the police try to adopt a high profile. That is, as soon as they mounted an operation, they would inform the media that uh, dozens of people have been arrested or hundreds of people holding two-way permits uh, suspected of um, engaging in prostitution are arrested. I think that serves a good deterrent effect. So when... Um, mounting large-scale operations every time they make sure the operation is large-scale, or they may even um, set out undercover agents if necessary. But because very often you're not able to get to the persons in charge, the so-called snakeheads. So what can you do to target the snakeheads? So they cannot uh, uh, serve as the go-between. Uh, because um, in that case, then the two-way permit holders won't find a place to, uh, to tr do their trade here without uh, the support of these intermediaries. Secretary, well, I have uh, figures for the different uh, police districts, including Yunnan you know, districts for you, Mr. Leung Chi, Chi, uh, Chi Chang. Uh, we ha I have the number of operations. Every time such operations are uh, um, done in a high-profile manner, because we want to send out messages to the public. That is, first, we don't and condone such behavior. Secondly, through the, um, the media attention. We want to tell those who are trying to break the law that they are put under close watch. Now, for such um, um, prostitution activities, uh, there are just more than just sex workers involved. So, if the public could pay attention to such uh, activities, maybe that would help to curb such uh, or, or reduce such activities at least. About uh, controlling um, premises for the purpose of um, prostitution, of course, that's against the law. So, the police attach great importance to um, catching those in charge. Uh, you use the term stink head, Mr. Leung. Uh, here we talk about people who procure or control prostitution or people who uh, benefit from such uh, prostitution activities. Uh, we, the police, attaches great importance to these people because they are usually um, the tribe gangs. Uh, this, uh, this prostitution is the main source of income to them. So that's why we, the police tries very hard to crack down on such activities. Now, we've also um, studied uh, court cases. Unless there's no conviction, as soon as there's a conviction, usually uh, there is an imprisonment penalty and the imprisonment term would be severe. But still, some people would want to um, break the law but uh, the police would uh, spare no effort in targeting them. Now, for people who live in the district, men or women, they are all very much bothered by such activities, of course. 
So we have to continue to pay attention to the problem, and within the realms of the law, we will continue to take action to tackle the problem. Thank you. Mr. Ray Chen. Thank you, President. I'm sure the Secretary would not deny this. In, um, in, um, inspection on the sex workers, uh, you, the uh, police had mounted undercover operations. But then some sex workers um, complained that um, police officers abused the powers and they enjoyed free um, sexual services. Now, Mr. Chenapan asked about the uh, figures of uh, uh, s cases involving sex workers in the past five years, but uh, do you also have figures about um, undercover operations in the past five years? And do you have any internal guidelines that when police officers are engaging in undercover operations, they must not uh, accept any free sexual services or to what degree can they enjoy free sexual services? If there's any breach of the guideline, would there be uh, disciplinary actions? Secretary, well, the answer is straightforward. When police targets uh, among such any device operations, uh, we want to prevent people from exploiting others um, f um, through a prostitution activities. And if necessary, um, undercover operations may have to be mounted so we could um, um, take um, uh, apprehend those uh, who break the law. Now, in the uh, operation. There are rules to be followed by the police officers, and uh, there are clear guidelines in this respect. That is, uh, um, the undercover agents may only have bodily contact if it is absolutely necessary in achieving the purpose of the operation. And as soon as the purpose is achieved, such bodily contact must be stopped. So there is an um, effective mechanism for the police to monitor the conduct of its officers. The senior management of the police before each operation would explain the rules in details to the relevant officers. We believe the arrangement is effective. And if there are any complaints, of course, there is a mechanism within the police force to handle such complaints. And we will go straightly by the uh, police complaints handling mechanism in dealing with these complaints. And after the complaints have been dealt with, we will go to the IP. PC, the Independent Police Complaints Council, uh, which will vet each and every complaint case. Well, uh, after the purpose is achieved, then bodily contact could, would, must be stopped. So does it mean that you allow police officers to accept a free sexual services? Uh, to what degree? The um, Secretary, I think my answer was clear. Mr. Chen Hanpen, thank you, President. Uh, the secretary said that, that in a unit, if there is one woman engaging in prostitution activities, it is not against law. But I think the bone of contention here is there are many units. You know, subdivided into many. Uh, there, there are one. There's one unit subdivided into many units, and then there are many people in that same uh, residential unit, but uh, uh, providing sexual services in the different subdivided units. So my question for the secretary is. What is the definition of a unit? Um, is it based on, say, an, a single water meter or electricity meter, or maybe under the lens registry that is a single unit? Because if you don't address this issue, then we're still going to see this problem in the districts. And it will continue to cause undue nuisances to the residents. Secretary, can you give me a clear answer? Secretary, well, it depends on individual cases. Based on what uh, Mr. Chen said, I can say this to you, Mr. Chen. Uh, let's say in one unit, it is subdivided into several units. The unit owner, uh, the uh, uh, tenant or whoever, the person in charge of the unit, uh, say he sublets the uh, subdivided units, and he knows that uh, the subdivided unit tenants are involved in such activities, then we will regard it as the single prostitution group or it's under control of one person. That's how we see it. And then we will then conduct investigation and we'll see whether we could consider doing this. That is, we'll see this as a unit being let out uh, to others who engage in prostitution activities. And if the evidence supports um, such a suspicion, then we could take action. Or if we have doubts, actually, we could uh, issue warning letters. We can tell the person in charge that this is actually against the law.
And if we have sufficient evidence, then we will take action. The last oral question, Ms. Uh, Dr. Priscilla Long. You take. Mr. President. The government has been deploying resources to further enhance the quality of coastal waters of the Victoria Harbour. And with the completion of this uh, project at the end of this year, it is expected that the water quality will substantially improve. However, it's been known that along the promenade, the fire water pipes of some private buildings have been misconnected to the stormwater drainage system, fire water pipe misconnection, causing all the problem. And also, uh, pollutants entering storm water drainage system through gully traps and to alleviate the problem, um, the gov government has uh, implemented a number of measures. On the 26th of June this year, the Finance Committee of this Council approved the funding application for the project on further enhancing the quality of coastal waters of the Victoria Harbour so that the authorities might commission a stu consultant study. Um, I have received a number of complaints from members of the public that the coastal waters of the Victoria Harbour giving off very strong stenches, which has caused a serious nuisance to members of the public. The problem is particularly serious in the areas along the water promenade. After inquiring with a number of government departments, I found that one of the causes for the emission of stenches from the seawater is that the foul water pipes of some private buildings in Hong Kong have been misconnected to the stormwater drainage system, foul water pipe misconnection. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, of the number of foul water pipe misconnection cases followed up by the authorities in each year since 2013? Among such cases, the number of those in which sewage was discharged into the Victoria Harbour Water Control Zone and the number of rectified cases with a breakdown by district council district and two of the respective numbers of foul water pipe disconnection cases since 2013 in which rectification was made after warnings or advice had been issued to the persons concerned, cases in which rectification was made after the persons concerned had been prosecuted, or statutory repair orders had been issued by the authorities, and cases in which the authorities implemented measures to rectify the misconnection because no rectification had been made despite the aforesaid law enforcement actions taken by the authorities. Whether the authorities have reviewed the effectiveness of such law enforcement actions, if they have, of the outcome. And three, given that the aforesaid consultancy study will not be completed until early 2018, whether the authorities will, prior to the implementation of the measures to be proposed by the study, step up inspections and efforts in combating illegal discharge of of wastewater and sewage and enhance initiatives to rectify foul water pipe misconnection, so to demonstrate the determination of the government to enhance the quality of coastal waters and develop a water friendly culture. Secretary for Environment. Mr. President, the government has been taking actions and allocating resources to improve the sewage collection and treatment systems for enhancing the quality of coastal waters of the Victoria Harbour. With the phased implementation of the Harbour Area Treatment Scheme, HATS, the water quality of the Victoria Harbour has been significantly improved. Upon completion of the HATS Stage 2A by the end of this year, the water quality of the Victoria Harbour will be further enhanced. However, the densely populated coastal areas have been developed for many years. Some sewage discharges are not diverted into public source network, and some sewage and pollutants are discharged via stormwater drains into the coastal waters of the Victoria Harbour causing odour problem. These discharges arise from various pollution sources, including misconnections of foul water pipes from buildings and public sewers to, to the storm drain systems, as well as street side pollutants that enter the storm drain system, etc. In order to reduce pollution of the near shore waters, the Environmental Protection Department, EPD, has taken a series of measures in collaboration with other departments. They include one, 
The EPD, Buildings Department and Drainage Services Department jointly follow up and rectify the foul water pipe misconnection cases. Two, the DSD carries out inspections, repairs and clearing of sediments for the public sewers and storm drainage systems on a regular basis. And three, the Food and Environmental Hygiene Department, FEHD and Highways Department provide routine rubbish cleansing services for public places and streets, as well as regular clearing of sediment and gully traps to reduce the amount of pollutants discharged into the drain storm drainage system, thereby affecting the nearshore water quality and generating odor problem. Four. The Marine Department cleans up floating refuse and provides free refuse collection service for vessels on a daily basis to prevent potential odor generated by the marine refuse. Regarding the control of wastewater discharge, the EDP EPD applies the Water Pollution Control Ordinance in seeking to intercept illegal discharge of sewage or other pollutants, whereas the Buildings Department regulates foul water pipe misconnections found in buildings under the Buildings Ordinance. In addition, the FEHD seeks to tackle illegal discharge of wastewater into stormwater drains in order to reduce the amount of pollutants entering the stormwater drains. Misconnected foul water pipe within buildings are unauthorized building works UBWs. The Buildings Department will take enforcement action in accordance with the Buildings Ordinance and the prevailing enforcement policy. In handling such cases, it takes time for the Buildings Department to carry out investigations to identify the units and the owners involved. When the concerned owners are identified, the Buildings Department will notify them and request arrangement of repair works in the first place. Where no repair works is carried out by the owners, the Buildings Department will serve removal or repair orders to them, demanding necessary works to be commenced and completed within a specified period. Those owners who fail to comply with the orders may be prosecuted, and the cost for government contractors to carry out the necessary works will be recovered from the owners. The Buildings Department takes enforcement action against foul water pipe misconnections in buildings as an ongoing commitment and will continue to work on such cases with the EPD and other departments concerned. Regarding questions raised by Dr. Priscilla Lang, the reply is as follows. One, the EPD found a total of 276 foul water pipe misconnection cases in Hong Kong between 2013 and September 2015. Among them, 157 cases of 57% were found within the Victoria Harbour Water Control Zone, of which, uh, of which 121 cases, about 77%, were rectified and the remaining 36 cases are being processed. Please refer to the enclosure for a breakdown of these cases by District Council. Of the 276 cases stated above, about 80% or 218 cases were rectified after warnings or advice had been issued, and three cases were rectified after repair orders had been served. We are currently following up on the remaining 20% of the cases. Our experience indicates that the enforcement actions have been effective. However, there are many pollution sources and also various factors causing the odor. We are therefore making preparations now to commence a consultancy study in order to formulate detailed improvement proposals. 3. The tendering of the said consultancy study is now underway. It is expected to begin early next year and specific recommendations will be drawn up upon completion in two years' time. While the study is being conducted, relevant government departments will step up the following measures in tackling the water quality and odor problems found in the East Shore area. 1. First, the EPD will progressively conduct surveys on misconnections in the Victoria Harbour areas. The EPD will tackle identified cases speedily together with the relevant departments. The survey for Hong Kong is underway and is scheduled for completion by the end of next year. The one for Wong Tai Sen will begin early next year. In addition, the EPD will check against illegal discharges during routine inspections and take enforcement actions against them. The DSD will also rectify any misconnections found in public sewer systems. Two. Furthermore, the DSD will seek funding approval for the upgrading of Central and East Kowloon Sewerage Project Phase 3. Apart from increasing the loading capacity of the sewerage systems, the project will also improve about 7 kilometers of existing sewers in Sampo Gong, Kowloon City, Tokawan, Hong Kong and Chim Sa Choi. 
The improvement works will help reduce and prevent untreated sewage from entering into the storm drainage systems. 3. Regarding the older problem at Hongham Promenade, the DST is exploring with the EPD the feasibility of installing dry weather flow intercept in the district. The DSD conducted cleansing works for the box culverts and the outfalls in the vicinity in mid-2015 and would, accre would increase the frequency of cleansing when necessary with a view to relieving the older problem at the Hongham Promenade. We understand the public expectations in resolving water quality through the consultancy project. We would uh, develop, develop detailed plans to prevent pollution and control the sources in order to resolve the problem in the long run. Dr. Priscilla, now I want to ask this question. While um, the Chief Executive mentioned the water-friendly culture in the past three policy addresses, and we welcome the initiative. We also visited the promenade at West Kowloon. We also um, learned something about the older problem there. And uh, the Secretary and Under Secretary for Environment also had a visit there. Now, for part three of the reply, now for Hong Kong Promenade, it is suggested that dry weather flow interceptor be installed. I mean, the DS is exploring the feasibility of installation of such. So, according to your assessment, can the dry weather flow interceptor resolve the problem? Because, according to the figures provided, they are somewhat different from the figures we got um, from uh, district councils. Because for Kowloon City altogether, there are 19 misconnection cases rec being rectified. But in the beginning of this year, we asked the district council. I mean, at the district council, the question was put, and the buildings department replied that there were already 19 cases in Hong Ham alone. So please go back and check the figures. And also, uh, part two of the reply, after the statutory order had lapsed, the buildings department would arrange for rectification works to be carried out and uh, for cost for government contractors be recovered from the owners. So is that the way to go about that? Apart from dry weather flow interceptors, this is the way you approach the issue in other districts. So what about cases in which no rectification has been done? Uh, Dr. Leung, well, uh, you seem to have asked a lot of questions just now. You should just ask one supplementary question. Please repeat the supplementary question that you wish the Secretary to answer. All right, Secretary, you mentioned that there are a lot of misconnection cases that are being followed up on by the Department. Are there cases that uh, in which or statutory orders have been issued, but no rectification has been carried out? And uh, is the department going to um, carry out rectification works and to order that costs be recovered from the owners? I didn't seem to hear that question uh, earlier, S Secretary. Well, basically, we share the same concern. Our department, along with other departments, work uh, jointly to tackle the problem. Now, regarding this, the figures provided by the Buildings Department to the District Council, perhaps it's a different way of expression. Sometimes we uh, use, uh, we provide figures based on the uh, buildings and sometimes based on units in the building. So maybe the expression of figures is different. Now, based on the buildings department's experience, there it, there has been a high percentage of cases in which rectification was carried out upon advice from the buildings department. But of course, there are cases in which statutory repair orders have to be issued before rectification takes place, and if rectification. Uh, is still not carried out, then the government would appoint contractors to carry out the necessary works and uh, recover costs from owners. Mr. Tony Chair, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Now, for the undesirable water quality in the near shore of the Victoria Harbour, as mentioned in the Secretary's reply, one of the causes may 
be due to misconnections of um, public, uh, sewers into um, stormwater drains by private buildings. Now, my question is, is the supervision adequate? And are there any requirements on the technicians involved in connecting the pipes? And under the mandatory inspection schemes, are building owners required to check if there are mis misconnections of pipes? Secretary, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your question. In handling the problem of older and the near shore area, we take a joint departmental approach. Now, Mr. Chair is asking about the work of the Buildings Department. Under the Buildings Department, how the, the Department supervises uh, such minority, uh, such minor building works. I can only say that there is a system under the existing framework, but maybe individual owners may have engaged contractors and their work may not be really up to standard. And there are also complex cases, maybe um, more complex alignment of pipes. And as a result, some may circumvent the issue by um, connecting the pipes into the stormwater drains. So the situation is quite complex, but we do have collaboration among departments to tackle the issue. That is under the existing ordinance will uh, will notify the building owners to carry out rectification, and as mentioned just now, the uh, mechanism of issuing warnings or advice has been quite effective. Over eighty or ninety percent of cases can be dealt with after issuing warnings, and in some other cases, rectification has been done after um, statutory repair orders are issued. Well, can I ask the Secretary to clarify whether the uh, supervision mechanism is inadequate? Secretary, anything to add? Well, we have a mechanism which forms a basis, but because of complexities, there are situations in which the uh, building owners may not fully comply with the building's ordinance. The building's department can review the situation. And I think the department can actively follow up on these cases. But in the majority of cases, they uh, could be dealt with um, in a satisfactory manner. Mr. James To, in Hong Ham and Togwa Wan, the near shore order problem is really serious. The solution is, of course, to tackle the problem at source, that is, to resolve the problem of pipe misconnections. I have a question on systemic improvement, Secretary. Now, in the future, when mandatory renovation or voluntary renovation projects are carried out, or perhaps operations with assistance to owners like the Operation Building Bright, this element of rectifying disconnected pipes can be included because if pipes of a building are misconnected, sewage will continue to be discharged into storm the storm water uh, drains. And it's really hard for frontline officers to identify the problem. So can we add this element so that in the future there is mandatory inspections of water pipes? Let's say if there is a case of misconnection, this case can be identified in the future via mandatory 
renovation schemes. Thank you, Mr. Toe, for your question. As I understand, in the past, for projects such as Operation Building Bright, this requirement was included and it was proved to be effective. Very often, according to cases at hand, due to various reasons, pipe misconnections exist. But of course, we take a comprehensive approach. We um, we have conducted a consultancy study uh, upstream, but on the downstream side, we uh, also installed uh, dry weather flow interceptors. But uh, all in all, we work with other d departments in uh, understanding and tackling the issue and implementing measures. Mr. To, the question is not answered. I'm asking about in, um, the uh, including this element under mandatory building inspection schemes, Secretary. Well, I think we can follow up on this point with the relevant department or bureau. Mr. Ng Leung Singh. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, regarding part three of the reply about the consultancy study, um, on um, misconnected foul water pipes in uh, Victoria Harbour area. I want to know whether uh, you have um, got uh, re um, the necessary funds for uh, recurrent expenditure. Well, we. I think there are two parts to this question. First of all, I thank uh, the Council for approving funding for this comprehensive study. And at the district level or division level, staff will be deployed to at appropriate times to follow up on the study. Well, as said just now, the consultancy study uh, will be completed in two years' time. And meanwhile, I think we should take a two-pronged approach. So our colleagues working at the different divisions would um, investigate into different cases. This is my brief reply. We've spent 22 and a half minutes uh, on this question. Bill.